This morning's reading is from James 5, 13, verses 13 to 18. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Let's get into our message for this morning. Thanks for allowing me to do that. We are, as Julie May said, we are in our final week of our series in James. I hope you've enjoyed it. A five-chapter book of the New Testament. We've taken nine weeks exploring the depths of what God has been teaching us in this New Testament letter of James. And it's been awesome, right? The, the series has been titled Faith in Action. What does a faith applied to the day-to-day look like? Because that's what we're interested in. We're not interested in a faith that lives only within the building on Sundays. We're not interested in a faith that only remains in our head and, and has nothing to do with what we do. In this series, we've looked at what does faith on the ground look like when it comes to suffering, when hard times hit us? What does our faith look like? What does faith in action look like when we make plans, when we deal with our finances, when we, when we speak? What does faith in action look like? Today, what does faith in action look like when it comes to prayer? What part should prayer play, lots of P's there, in our lives? It's a great question, isn't it? Great question. What does faith in action look like when it comes to prayer, our prayer lives? Now, this is a great one to be tackling together because some of us, I think, might have a bit of a narrow view when it comes to prayer. We can, we can be kind of selective about parts of our lives that we bring to God in prayer. You know what I mean? We, can, we, we tend to compartmentalize, and prayer doesn't often become part of our life's rhythm. What's our attitude? What's your attitude? What's your posture towards God when it comes to prayer? Do we kind of tend to treat him a little bit like a vending machine? You know, when we need something, we sort of press, press, try to press the correct combination and then just hope or even expect to get what we want. Or do we treat God in prayer like an insurance policy? I'd better pray just in case. I'd better pray just in case nothing, so nothing bad happens. I tell you what, there's nothing worse than being broken down on the side of the road and you've let your NRMA insurance policy lapse. I've been there, nothing worse. Can you come and fix, oh no, you're uh, lapsed, oh man. Nothing worse than being stranded. We don't want to get caught on the side of the road of life, unprayed, and so we'd better pray just in case. Do we treat God in prayer like an insurance policy? Or do we just generally kind of feel a bit guilty that we're not praying enough? We think it's something I should be doing more. Or are we just kind of a bit confused about how to pray? No one's ever taught me. How do I do it? How are we to approach prayer? It's an enormous topic. We're not going to begin to scratch the surface of it really this morning. But we are going to look at what James is trying to teach us when it comes to prayer. A faith in action involves prayer. That's the context of his teaching this morning. All of life. Pretty clear from the first verse. Let's have a look together. Verse 13, first verse for today. Some of these verses are a little tricky to understand. So I'm glad you're, you're awake. I'm glad you're caffeined up because we're going to be flexing some muscles this morning. First couple of verses are all right. We're going to hit verse 15. And you're going to think, how are we going to do this? We're going to do it 
together. Verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. How's life going for you at the moment? How's it going? Hit a tough time? Hit a hurdle? Been raining a lot? Oh, who is over the rain? Nice today, though. Good on you for being here. You're the real Christians. (laughs) You're not out there enjoying the sun. You know I'm kidding. Been isolating because of COVID? That's a real one. Been going through some trouble at the moment, some tough times. What's your first reaction when you hit a tough time, when you go into trouble? What do you do? What's your go-to? Are you calling and texting a certain group of people, everybody you know, dumping our anxiety on them, grumbling? Gee, we looked at that last week, didn't we? Grumbling to anyone and everyone who will hear, neighbors, friends, families, baristas, checkout person at the supermarket, anyone with a pulse. Are you in trouble? Pray. James is encouraging us to live out our faith in a very real way. Don't let anybody tell you the Bible isn't practical. Are you in trouble? Pray. And James, just, he is not alone in teaching this concept. 1 Peter 5 says this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Or well, Philippians four, isn't it? Philippians four, verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's faith in action. That's faith in action. Are you in trouble? Pray. Are you happy? Oh, we don't need to pray. Is that what he says? Are you in trouble? Pray. Are you happy? Oh, you don't need to talk to God then. Are you happy? What does James say? Then pray. He says, particularly, sing songs of praise. See, this is what we're talking about this morning. This is our take home, including everything, including God in every situation in our lives. Rather than having a relationship with God, but we only talk to Him, we only go to Him when something isn't right, but we're not doing well. Could you say that's a balanced relationship? If we were part of a human relationship like that, it wouldn't be super healthy. Do we have a balanced relationship when it comes to God? Are you happy? Pray. Praise. Do we praise God when things do end up going our way? That does happen, doesn't it? James here is saying, sing songs of praise, right? Now, you could do that. We do that at church. All my life you've been faithful. We just sang that, didn't we? All my life, you are so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Beautiful words, aren't they? Are you happy? You could sing that at home, if you want. Could be a little bit like living in a musical. I don't know if you're keen on that, but you could could sing. You could just pray. I think that's okay, too, that we're getting the gist of it. You could pray prayers of praise. Because I believe this is, this is important, right? This is a mark of maturity. It's what it is. A mark of maturity in our faith is our level of gratefulness, of thankfulness. Colossians 2 says this. It's one of my, some of my favorite verses. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord... Continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. A marker of spiritual maturity is our level of thankfulness, our level of gratefulness. Don't you love that? Overflowing with thankfulness. Are our lives marked by gratefulness? See, the more we pray, the more we praise, it's just the more opportunities we have to give God the glory. And this, I think, is true too. 
the more we pray, the more we praise, the more we give Him, we see just how intimately involved He actually is in our lives, because He is. A way to open up our eyes to that? Cultivate more thankfulness. Now, the context of James's teaching, what are we talking about this morning? It starts with P, we are talking about prayer. Thank you. Okay, we're talking about prayer. And now, James moves on to a different scenario. You in trouble? Pray. You happy? Pray. Are you sick? No prizes for what happens, for what he says. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Let's work through this together. Now, not hard to imagine a member of the church community being pretty sick at home, unable to come to the church gathering, right? What's this person to do? Pray. Pray. But also invite others to pray with them. It's helpful to notice, I think, it is the sick person's decision to call the elders into their presence and pray. Now, who are the elders? Simply mature people of faith. Mature people of faith who are part of the church. Leaders, pastors, just godly people, lay leaders, you know, godly people of character in the church. Invite them over to pray. What are the elders to do? Pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And you can imagine this person's most likely sitting down because they're really unwell. So praying over them makes sense. But this could also be talking about the practice of laying on of hands. You know, as part of Paul's ministry, the Apostle Paul, he would lay hands on people and pray. And this is quite common today. It's part of our practice often. We'll, when we pray for someone, we'll ask, do you mind if I put my, my hand on your, on your shoulder to pray for you? See, what James is talking about here is intercessory prayer. That's just a big word, really. That just means praying for someone. Praying for someone. There's more to say about it in the rest of the passage. We'll get there in a minute. Praying for someone. On behalf of someone. Here's the key thing of this verse. We'll get to the oil in a minute. You're probably wondering, what's the deal with that? We'll get to it. But the key thing in the verse is what? In whose name do we pray? The name of the Lord. Right? When we are praying for people, we're bringing their needs to God on the basis of His resources, not mine, because my resources are incredibly finite. His, infinite. So we are, when we are praying for someone, we're bringing specific needs of that person to God on the basis of His resources. We need to get out of the way, in a way, right? It's not about us. In the name of the Lord, not really about us, about others. Very little to do with us, far more to do with in whose name we pray. Such a privilege to pray for people. Such a privilege to be prayed for. More on it in a little while. Okay, what's the deal with the oil? What's the deal? Some people think it, uh, James is mentioning it here for medicinal reasons that it had heal certain healing properties. Uh, if you read the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus teaches, the Good Samaritan uh, binds up the wounds of the robber and uses oil to, to help that person. So it could mean that. Bring the oil to this particular prayer gathering in someone's home because it, it could help. Maybe. I don't think it's probably why it's mentioned here. Here's what I think. In those times, biblical times, New Testament times, oil had a lot of spiritual significance. It could symbolize the overflowing grace of God. It also, even more so, was used as a symbol of anointing something for the Lord. What does that mean? It means um, dedicating to, consecrating to, giving over to God. Oil was used as a symbol to do that. You know, kings were anointed with oil when they came to power, right? Set apart for God for a particular season and a task. So, in our circumstance here, using oil with a sick person, it's a tangible way of dedicating this person and their request to God, right? A physical act expressing a spiritual truth. Prayer is expressing this point with words, God, we dedicate this person to you, we give their healing over to you, 
anointing with oil expresses it in action. Does that make sense? So, should we use oil today? If you want. If you like. I think there's freedom. See, I, I, I personally, I think our culture today, very little significance when it comes to oil. We use it for cooking mostly, right? Most people attach very little significance to it. So, I don't think there's a need for it, but there's no harm. No harm, absolutely. If the sick person wishes for this to happen, so be it. There's nothing special or magical about the oil, okay? Because in whose name do we pray? That's what really matters. In the name of the Lord. People are, of course, free to use it. I've seen oil used in in, in prayers for healing like this and also not, and both are fine and good. There's freedom. Most important thing to remember Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. It's His power, it's His resources we are drawing upon. Okay, that verse wasn't that tricky. Next one, it's a bit tricky. Ready? We'll do this together. Verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Okay. Okay. What's going on here? Let me say a couple of things first. There are some verses in Scripture, some passages in Scripture, in the Bible, that are difficult to understand. Understand, It's true. And I think this is one of them. One, of the, one commentator says, this is one of the trickiest verses in the entire New Testament. Lucky me, excited to be dealing with this today. But here's the thing. Don't confuse what I've just said with the Bible is hard to understand. The Bible is unclear. No, no, I didn't say that. That's not true. Some parts of Scripture are hard to understand. The central message of the Bible is clear. Okay. So this doesn't mean every verse of the Bible is easy to understand, but nor does a difficult passage call into question the whole message of the Bible. You with me? Not at all. So, when we come across a hard-to-understand passage, what are we supposed to do? Not ignore it. What are we supposed to do? We ask a question. What does the rest of the Bible have to say about this topic? The Bible is a unified whole. Over 40 human authors, one author, God. The Bible is incredibly unified. And so we ask, what has the rest of the Bible got to say about this? Well, can we have a look together, just quickly? Let's have a few examples What do we take away from this? How do we learn? All right, well, let's have a look at some examples. Jesus himself. But before we do that, let me say something else. (laughs) Sorry. Okay, because I want to set it up like this. Okay, excuse me. Sorry. Right. Best practice, what have I said? Interpret difficult to understand passages with other parts of Scripture. I've said that. Okay, so... Rewind. On plain reading, it seems to say that if the elders pray like this for this sick person, they will be healed. It does seem to say that, doesn't it? If the elders pray, they will be healed. How do we understand that? Let's have a look. Some people have said, let's just ignore this verse. Some people do that in reality. We're just going to skip over this this part of James. We're not going to do that. Some people say when it comes to this verse, when it comes to the issue of prayer, healing and prayer, they'll just kind of deny it happens today or very much downplay it. God is a God of miracles, but He seemed to do most of those miracles in the past, doesn't really do them much today. Let's not really think about it. Not a view I agree with. I think it's incredibly difficult to come to that conclusion using the Bible. I would say that's not a biblical conclusion, my, my view. Difficult to support from Scripture. Other people think this passage isn't actually talking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual healing. This person is spiritually unwell, unwell r- struggling with extreme doubt, extreme weak faith. The word for well can also mean saved in the Greek. Uh, You know, raise up could mean raise up their faith or raise them up at the resurrection of the last day. Could mean that. 
Personally, I think that's a stretch. I think it's talking about sickness, physical sickness, so it probably doesn't mean it. Okay, what could it mean? Is it possible to read this and conclude that if the elders of the church and the sick person have enough faith, they will get well? Can we come to that conclusion? If we want to, if that's where we want to land on this, if we want this explanation to be right, if we want to conclude it, then we've got to conclude this next statement too. You with me? We've got to include, if we want that to be true, we've got to include this. If you're experiencing bad health and you've prayed for healing, other godly people have prayed for healing and you haven't been healed, your faith, their faith is inadequate. We are talking about the view that you will be healed according to your measure of faith. Can that be true? Are we able to come to this conclusion based on what other parts of Scripture say? This is where I fast forwarded to. So, let's have a look at some examples together. Come on, let's look at the Bible together. Let's look at Jesus Himself. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before His crucifixion. You know the story? If you don't, Jesus on His knees, praying to God. What does He pray? He knows what's ahead of him. He is suffering in a turmoil. He's about to suffer extreme physical, emotional, mental turmoil. He knows what's before him, and he prays, God, if there is any other way, take this cup of suffering away from me. If there's any other way. And what was his answer from God the Father? His answer was, son... No. Do you know that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, got a no in His prayer life? No. There is no other way. Jesus then prays what we'll come back to, what? Your will be done. Did Jesus not have enough faith for His suffering to be taken away? Okay, now you might be thinking, mm, Dave, that's a bit of a weird example. Jesus, you know, a bit of a different category to us, sinless Son of God. All right, let's look at the Apostle Paul. Let's do this together. 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. This is Paul speaking. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Apostle Paul, not a perfect man, but a man chosen by God to be the Apostle of the Gentiles. He experienced a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that means. Some sort of, something that tormented him, it wasn't good. And he prayed, Lord, take it away. And what was his answer? No. No, my grace is sufficient for you. Can we conclude Paul didn't have enough faith? Can we conclude that his faith was weak? He wasn't a real Christian. <laughs> Jesus doesn't rebuke his lack of faith. Paul, I want you to have more faith in me, then you'll be healed. No, what does he say? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is speaking to Timothy, and uh, he mentions Timothy's bad stomach issues. Timothy was a bit sickly, and he had some sickness he was suffering from. What does Paul say to him? You can read it, 1 Timothy 5. What does he say? He says, hey, Timothy, maybe have some wine as well as water. That's what he says to him. Hey, you, you guys feeling a bit sick? Have some wine, you'll be right. My pastor told me. <laughs> okay, don't conclude that. Now, why did Paul say that? Well, maybe sometimes, we don't really know, but maybe the water was a bit impure, you know, we don't know, and wine had alcohol in it, so maybe that could have helped. I don't really know, okay? But I don't want to go there. But it's interesting, there's no talk of a prayer of faith. There's no talk of commanding him to pray for healing. Tim, you are sick because of your lack of faith. 
nowhere to be found. Right? He doesn't rebuke him for being sick as if this was evidence of a weak faith. It's just a health tip. Have some more magnesium, you'll be right. Like, oh, weird, hey? What about, our, what about your experience? I'm interested. What about our experience? What about the church's experience over 2,000 years of history? Honestly, there have been too many people to count. Too many, so many godly people of faith over the centuries, people that I have known, people that I know personally today, that daily live with significant health issues. What do we conclude? We cannot include, we must, sorry, conclude, and we must not proclaim to them that their faith is weak. Right? It's not only discouraging, which it is, but I think it's unbiblical. Because a major theme of the Bible is persevere to the end. Jesus is with you. Persevere to the end. Right? If life isn't difficult, then we don't really need to persevere, do we? If all we need to do is just pray this particular prayer of faith, we'll be healed. Where does perseverance come in? you would think there'd be a lot more teaching around this prayer of faith idea, because if it's true, I'd like to know a lot more about it. Now, the truth is we know pain can produce godliness. I do not think we can conclude that only people pretending to be Christians who don't have a genuine faith, weak Christians, they don't experience healing. No, friends. We can't conclude that, I believe, if we want to take the Bible seriously. And here's the thing about these things. The Bible has to be our guiding light. Otherwise, it's just who's got the loudest voice? Who's got the microphone? Nowhere else in the Bible does it talk about physical healing in the way James does here. In fact, I think we've got to conclude from all the teaching in the Bible about suffering, including James himself... So much of what he talks about is suffering and hardship in this life. We've got to conclude that it's the normal experience in the Christian life. Okay, Dave. So what do we do when it comes to praying for physical healing? Pray! Gee, you're confusing. I know! I wish it was more clear-cut. I'm sorry, that's all you're going to get this side of heaven. But we must pray. We must pray. Because the truth is, God can and does heal today. That is the truth. I've experienced it up close, in this church and elsewhere. And I believe God can and does work miracles today. We must pray to Him for healing. We're commanded to. But we can't command Him to heal. Can't do that. That's a role reversal. He's God, we are not. We can't command God to heal, but we can ask Him to. We can believe Him to, but we can't require Him to. He doesn't answer every prayer for healing with a yes. And many of you know this firsthand. Faith then, faith is still believing when the answer is no. That's when our faith gets a real workout, amen? Lord, I'm asking for healing in your name because you tell us to. You tell us to ask, seek, knock, to be persistent. But your will be done. It takes faith to pray that. Like Christ in the garden. Or like Paul. Your grace is sufficient for me. What does that mean? It means I don't need this healing in order to love you. You are enough for me. I love you anyway. That's faith. I think this is what faith-filled prayer is. Trusting God with the outcome. If it ends with healing or not, we should ask. We must ask, and we leave the result with Him. Okay, how are you feeling? Good, good, good workout? All right, we're going to keep moving. We don't have much to go, but stay with me. Something else confusing going on too, okay? I'm, I'm not going to apologize. I didn't write this. Okay, so 
Verse 15, we've, we've looked at this, and in the prayer, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, what's going on here? Can we conclude that people, some people become sick because of sin? I'm not talking about you have sinfully eaten too much chocolate and KFC and now you're feeling ill. I'm not talking about that. Can we conclude this? Some people have gotten sick because of their sin. Well, generally speaking, the whole book of Job would indicate no, really. Generally speaking, particularly Jesus is pretty keen to point out that's generally not how things work. In John 9, a bunch of people bring a man born blind to him, and they say to him, what sin did his parents commit to make this happen? Jesus says, doesn't work like that. It's not karma, right? Doesn't work like that. Thank God, His operating principle is grace. We don't get what we deserve, or we'd all be blind. It's a result of living in a fallen and broken world, right? Suffering, there is a mystery to it. The result of living in a fallen and broken world. However, Paul does mention something in 1 Corinthians 5. The church is kind of going a bit crazy. I think Corinthians could be titled, Christians Gone Wild, pretty out there. We think we've got problems in our congregation. Just go ahead and read 1 and 2 Corinthians. Whew. There are people acting in pretty ungodly ways, very self-interested when it came to the Lord's Supper. And Paul seems to indicate because of that, they've fallen ill. Some maybe even have died. Bit hard to understand, but that seems to be what he's saying. So, it's possible the two might be connected. It's possible. Really? Whoa. Should we, like, totally freak out right now? Yes. No, of course not. What should the Christian do then? Not freak out. Why? What should we do? What has James been teaching us to do? What's, what's today about? It's about, the word starts with P? Prayer. So what do we do? We pray. We pray in all circumstances. Are you in trouble? Pray. You happy? Pray. You sick? Pray. In this instance... Pray in all circumstances. Hey, pray for forgiveness. Why not use the time when we're ill to examine our hearts before God? God is full of grace and compassion, justice and mercy. Why not ask Him to reveal, God, is there, is there any sin I need to confess? I am not saying the two are connected, but I'm saying what's the harm in praying? What's the harm in seeking Him? There does not need to, need to be some weird mystery around this because Christians know when we pray and ask for forgiveness, what do we get? Forgiveness right? We bring our whole lives before God and we ask for forgiveness that we can be guaranteed to receive. Now, we're almost done here. James mentions in verse 16, another way prayer can be used in the life of the church. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It's a beautiful verse. Another way prayer can be used in the church. Confess sin to each other, pray for each other. We, we mentioned this before, intercessory prayer, praying for each other. Okay, so what we're going to do now, turn to the person next to you and tell them, confess to them the deepest and darkest secrets of your heart. I'm kidding, we're not going to do that, of course. Phew, some of you just woke up. We're not going to do that. But it does beg the question, are there people in your life, people of faith, Christians, that you can go to and talk about these things? Yeah, confess to. Sh openly share your life with. Share your struggles. What does James say? This can bring healing. And we finish today with James encouraging us again to be people of prayer with the example of the prophet Elijah. We'll just touch on this. He says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being just like us, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Why does he give this example? He's pointing out Elijah, who did some pretty amazing things, is a person just like you and me. Elijah was a person just like us, not superhuman, not an angel, just like us. And he prayed 
for some almighty things, and they came to pass. God had revealed exactly what he says there. A drought would come, and it would be broken, and the rains would come. Elijah prayed accordingly. It was revealed to him this would happen. He prayed in line with God's will, and they happened. Elijah was a person just like us. He prayed for some amazing things, and some amazing things happened. Okay, let's wrap up this morning together. What's our takeaway? What are we taking away this morning as we finish up? Our takeaway should not be this. Oh, what's the point in praying? God's going to do what he does anyway. Wrong. If that's your takeaway, go home immediately and re-listen to this message. No way. God's going to do what he does anyway. I'm not going to pray. No. It shouldn't either be, oh, God must answer all my prayers in the affirmative. He must. No, no, neither are true. Okay, so what's the takeaway? Let prayer become part of every aspect of our lives. You in trouble? Pray. You happy? Pray. You sick? Pray. You got something to confess? Pray. Get some people around you and pray. You're really sick? Gather somebody to church and pray. Pray, pray, pray. Not, oh, I'm not going to bother praying. No, pray. But I don't know the outcome. Yeah, you're not God. You're not meant to know everything. This is faith in action. This is faith applied. I'm going to pray and I'm going to trust Him with the outcome. The people of God pray. And we pray with faith. We fervently pray with faith to our wonderful and good God. And we believe God will do what is best for those who love Him. The truth is, our prayers are powerful and effective. It doesn't mean everything we'll pray will come to pass. It does mean we are empowered when we pray. Your will be done. Your grace is sufficient for me. Let's pray together now. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you at any time in our lives when we're in trouble, when we're joyful, when we're sick, when we're confused, when we're full of doubt. We can come to you and we know that you hear us. We are, we are convinced, we know that you hear us and we know that you have our best intentions at heart. Lord, help us to be people that pray as we talk about Alpha, help us to be people that pray for big things, for people to come to faith, for people to know you, for hearts to be changed. I ask God that we would be fueled to pray and that our faith would grow in you, that our trust would grow in you. We'd be people who pray. We love you, God. Build us in this. Build our faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.